so uh, you need to have the focus and uh, still there are some muggable crammable aspects which you need to share with classmates now <clears throat> let us talk about visual system which we have already mastered in after i'll try to go a little faster the optic nerve cranial nerve 2 is a special somatic apparatus look at the retina embryologically where it comes from it comes from the optic vesicle of the diencephalon it contains the efferent fibers that give rise to the optic nerve if you look at optic nerve honestly we should not call it a nerve optic nerve is actually a fiber tract derived from the diencephalon it is sensitive to 400 to 700 nanometers. So, this we have umpteen number of times reviewed in ophthalmology. The visual fields from the retina, how do they pass, how do they decussate in optic chiasma. So, how they will be ultimately landing up at lateral geniculate body and ultimately will be projecting to the visual cortex, which is located in. Uh, the area 17 and in the process what is the importance of the pulvinar nucleus in the thalamus which is the largest nucleus um, etc etc now you are a radiologist tomorrow so what will you recognize doctor you have this optic nerves and uh, uh, they are ultimately joining up at the optic chiasma. Now, this is a coronal view where it is uh, a optic nerve entering optic canal has been projected over here. Then this is another important view where uh, you are able to see that there are cerebral, anterior cerebral arteries beneath that you are having the optic chiasma and uh, the pituitary stalk. So, these are all the important structures which are very closely related. Now, in the retina, what is optic disc doctor, which we have spoken in length? Uh, in ophthalmology, it is located 3.5 mm nasal to the Fovea centralis and optic disc basically contains the unmyelinated axons from which layer of retina ganglion layer of the retina and uh, the optic disc from where the optic nerve is starting if you take that area it is called blind spot because it does not have rods not cones. And it contains one central cup, a peripheral disc margin and the retinal vessels which are passing through it. Then you have one macular lutea which is a yellow pigmented area that surrounds the fovea centralis. Fovea centralis which is in the center of macular lutea is about 2.5 disc diameters from the optic disc. Optic disc is here, 2.5 disc diameters temporal will be the fovea centralis. Fovea need to be remembered because it has only cones. Optic disc need to be remembered because it has no rods, no cones. It is a vascular fovea and uh, it uh, is by the diffusion from the chorea capillaris, it will be receiving all the nutrients. And since it has cones, it mainly helps in the photopic day vision and also in the color perception. Now, what is the blood supply to the retina mainly, doctor? Underneath the retina you have the choroid. So, the choreocapillaries of the choroid will be supplying nutrients and the central artery of the retina which is the branch of the femoral artery is another important supply, blood supply to the retina. Now, if you look at the cells of the retina, there are a chain of three different neurons that project the visual impulses via the optic nerve and ultimately to the lateral geniculate body to the visual cortex. 
Now what are the various types of cells? You have the photoreceptors, which are called the rods and cones. They are the first order receptor cells that respond to the light stimulation. And uh, they basically generate only graded potentials, not action potentials. And they utilize the glutamate, one of the favorite MCQ of the examiner. Glutamate is the neurotransmitter used by the rods and cones. Anyway, we will discuss this more in uh, physiology. Rods are around 100 million and they contain rhodopsin which is visual uh, pigment and uh, they are sensitive to low intensity light and the scotopic night vision. Cones are only 7 million and they contain iodopsin, high illumination. They are localized in fovea centralis and they are important for the color vision, visual acuity and the day vision. So how will be the convergence, doctor? Typically, if you look at uh, the rods, the rods will be typically having have a higher convergence, which ultimately to the where will convergence occur? Rods or cones will ultimately converge onto bipolar cells and ultimately into retinal ganglion cells. Retinal ganglion cell fibers constitute the optic nerve. Now, what are these bipolar cells? Bipolar cells are called the second order neurons. Lot of times students will have confusion. Finally, if an MCQ comes, what is the second order neurons? We will be thinking, is it ganglion cells or bipolar cells? Without any second stumbling, you need to answer. Bipolar cells are the second order neurons that basically relay the stimuli coming from the rods and cones to the ganglion cells. Just like rods and cones can only produce graded potentials even bipolar also. They also will utilize glutamate as the neurotransmitter. Then after the bipolar cells, everything will merge on to the ganglion cells, which are the third order neurons. And the axons of this ganglion cells, they basically form the optic nerve. Now, if you look at the ganglion cells, Ganglion cells are those retinal cells which have a voltage gated sodium channel and uh, they produce action potential. So what will photoreceptors produce? Graded potential. Bipolar cells, graded potential. But it is the ganglion cells that produce the action potential and they have the voltage gated sodium channels. Ultimately, the fibers of the ganglion cells will be projecting to superior colliculus, to the pretectal nucleus. Why pretectal nucleus? Because from the ganglion cells, the fibers go to pretectal nucleus, Edinger West Pole, ciliary ganglion, sphincter pupillae, pupillary constriction, whenever the light falls. Then why will they go to superior colliculus? To the superior colliculus, lateral geniculate body, and ultimately to the visual cortex. Then they also project to hypothalamus because hypothalamic nucleus is what? Which nucleus? Suprachiasmatic nucleus is there, no? It receives the input from the ganglion cell fibers and that's how our uh, circadian rhythm is controlled by supraoptic nucleus when it receives the clue from the uh, ganglion cells about the daylight or night. Huh? Then Ganglion cells also use glutamate as the neurotransmitter. So they are the main cells. Then, typically in the retina we have interneurons. One type of interneurons are called horizontal cells. What do they do? They interconnect the photoreceptors, interconnect the photoreceptors one with the other and also the bipolar cells. They basically cause the inhibition of the neighboring photoreceptors. That is called phenomena of lateral inhibition. So that there is a sharpening of the visual focus. Credit goes to these interneurons which are called horizontal cells which are inhibitory interneurons. Even horizontal cells produce graded potentials. They use GABA as a neurotransmitter and they are very important to play a role in the differentiation of the colors. Credit goes to the lateral inhibition created by the horizontal cells.
Then we have another type of interneuron which is called amacrine cells. You can see this is the amacrine cell. This one is the amacrine cell. And uh, you have the bipolar cell. So we are talking about this amacrine cell. These are the amacrine cells. They don't have any axons, but they have few dendrites. They receive an input from the adjacent bipolar cells. And they in turn will project the inhibitory signals, the amacrine cells. Uh, project the inhibitory signals to the ganglion cells. And what is their importance? Since they are receiving input from bipolar cells and they project to the ganglion cells, they create a bipolar ganglion cell synapse. They are the mediators of the connectivity between bipolar and the ganglion cells, these interneurons which are called amacrine cells. They utilize GABA, glycine, dopamine, acetylcholine as the neurotransmitters, amacrine. Then we have Muller cells. What are the importance of it? Mullers are fundamentally like astrocytes in the brain. What is the purpose of astrocytes? They provide blood brain barrier and they are supporting cells. So, the radial glial cells are called as Muller cells. They have a support function. You can see the inner part of a Muller cell. They have got a support function similar to astrocytes. And typically they extend all the way from inner limiting membrane to the outer limiting membrane. They extend the Muller cells. This is all the story of the cellular architecture of the retina. Now, we talk about the visual pathway. So, what do you have in uh, uh, visual pathway? That's good. Vijay Rohit is very strong to know why absence is involved in posture vermis when medulloblastoma is compressing it. Our neurology unit 1 chief already said, Manu proposes that medulloblastoma is very close to the pons, lower pons. So, it lead to compression while growing on the abdescence which is exiting the lower pons. See, one chief talks to the other chief and they are getting the answers. So, the role of uh, attending uh, any interactive program is to get good friends. So, that uh, nowadays with Facebook, Twitter, social media and online websites, it is easy to get a solution. So, shortly we are also coming up with uh, a facility for posting your specific questions where others can, like a forum. So, a more interactive forum. So, our WordPress site is getting ready shortly. Alright. So, temporal hemiretina and we have a nasal hemiretina. Retina is uh, two parts. But there is a small fixing part in this. What is that? If you look at the temporal part of the hemi retina, it receives the impulses coming from the nasal part of the visual field. Agree, doctor? And nasal part of the hemi retina receives the visual impulses coming from the temporal part of the visual field. That is the reason when the nasal hemiretinal fibers pass through the optic chasma, they undergo decussation. So, if you have a pituitary adenoma compressing the optic chasma centrally, who can got affected? Nasal hemiretinal fibers. But nasal hemiretina is receiving the impulses coming from temporal field. Hence, you have the blindness involving the Temporal fields and you get a bitemporal hemianopia. Right? And any compression coming from lateral aspect and uh, compressing is affecting the uncrossed fibers of the temporal hemiretina, which is receiving the vision from the nasal field. Hence, binasal hemianopia will be there by a laterally compressing uh, force. That's all the story. So, where will temporal hemiretina will be ultimately projecting into the lateral geniculate body, doctor? 
here there is an interesting part. If you look at the lateral geniculate body, first of all, where is geniculate bodies are located? They are part of thalamus or midbrain? Thalamus. Thalamus or midbrain? Ah, thank God. I still remember at the end of the neurology posting in MD, our chief asked, spinal cord is a part of LMN or UMN? That was the last day of posting. Our answer was LMN. Oh, you learnt a lot. Go home. You can't learn also. So, then while coming we thought, why chief said like that? Oh, even corticospinal descending tract is there, so it can be LMN, UMN, both the things. So, at the end of neuroanatomy, if you are still thinking geniculate body is part of which, uh, then uh, yeah, I think I taught you very well all these uh, previous 20 classes, 20 hours, all right. I am happy everyone is saying uh, uh, correct answer only, huh? good. So, if you look at this lateral geniculate body, it is somatotopically divided. So, the temporal hemiretinal fibers which are coming from ipsilateral, they will be going to the uncrossed way, they will be going to the ipsilateral LGB, lateral geniculate body. They report to layers 2, 3, 5. In the somatotopic organization of the LGB. Whereas, if you look at uh, the nasal hemiretina, it goes to the contralateral LGB and it will be reporting to the layer 1, 4 and 6. That is the whole idea. That lateral geniculate body is somatotopically stratified. Then upper retinal quadrants will receive the image input from the lower visual fields. Obviously, no. What we see in the sky will be reported to our lower retina. What we see on the floor is uh, received by our upper quadrant of the retina. And they ultimately go to the LGB and they will be ultimately ending up in the visual cortex at the calcarine fissure. Once more, calcarine fissure is like a river. There is one upper bank, lower bank. So, the upper retinal quadrants will be reporting lower visual fields which will be ultimately reported in the visual cortex at where upper bank of calcarine fissure. And the lower retinal quadrants will receive the upper visual field and it will be reported to the lower banks of the calcarine fissure. That is the story. Now, if you look at the retina concentrically, if you divide it, central part is called macula. Macula surrounds fovea and it uh, is important for the central vision. High visual acuity contains the cones, macula and predominantly it will project to which part of visual cortex? Posterior part of the visual cortex. Whereas, paramacular area around the macula it mainly has rods and it will be reporting in the visual cortex. Visual cortex you assume is a structure which is anteroposterally uh, located, think front to back. So, that place where macular representation is there to that anteriorly paramacular representation will be there in the visual cortex. That is the somatotopic organization of the macula, paramacula. Then very peripheral part of the visual field will be there. That is called as peripheral monocular field. That will be much more anterior in the visual cortex, its representation. Much anterior to the area where paramacular area got reported. And any lesion of this monocular, I mean uh, the paramacular, I mean monocular areas representation in the visual cortex will lead to contralateral side a crescentic defect of the monocular most peripheral area of the vision. Eh? So, that is the story. Now, let us look at the visual pathway. From where to where you call visual pathway from the retina to lateral geniculate body ultimately going to the visual cortex which is in the area 17 of the occipital lobe. So, the ganglion cell layer of the retina is the starting point its axons will form cranial nerve 2. And typically from the nasal hemiretina, it will decussate and go to the contralateral LGB and ipsilateral and the temporal retina will go to the ipsilateral LGB. 
So what is optic nerve basically? It is a myelinated tract more than a nerve, it is a tract of the CNS. It is not a true nerve, it is invested by pia and arachinoid and dura and it receives the blood flow from the central retinal arteries which we have already discussed. And this optic nerve is surrounded by the subarachinoid space because all meninges are there around the optic nerve. And it is incapable of degener regeneration if it is being transected and any compression of it lead to atrophy. And any transection of this optic chiasma, I mean of this optic nerve will lead to ipsilateral blindness. At the chiasma level if you transect what will happen? The contralateral uh, nasal fibers are traveling through it. So that lead to uh, temporal scotoma. Huh? otherwise called junctional scotoma. So this is one important summary doctor which you should not forget. So which defect we finished? Suppose if optic nerve is transected then there is a ipsilateral monocular vision loss. Then what is the next level? Binacial homoimus defect. Why is it happening? In the optic chiasma, if there is any lateral compression, then it leads to binacial homonymous defect. Then you have what else? Um, bitemporal, bitemporal homonymous defect, bitemporal hemianopsia. Why will it occur? Any centrally compressing lesion on the optic chiasma or or what else? If there is any lesion involving the optic tract connecting the optic chiasma with the lateral geniculate body, in that you have one side nasal, I mean contralateral side nasal and ipsilateral side temporal. So there can be development of a uh, there can be de de development of any uh, homonymous heminopsias will be there if the optic tract is involved. Eh? Then uh, uh, let's take it forward. We have an optic chiasma which is a part of the diencephalon. I'm continuing after optic nerve, and uh, it is in relation with pituitary and diaphragma cellae. It contains the decussating fibers, and the non-crossing fibers come from the two temporal hemiretinae and it receives the blood flow which one optic chiasma from the anterior cerebral artery and the internal carotid artery and any mid sagittal session like a pituitary tumor will lead to bitemporal and any calcified internal carotids can cause lateral compression leading to binacial hemianopsia okay doc then after the optic chiasma what is the next important uh, uh, part doctor? Typically you are having the optic tract. So what is optic tract has? Ipsilateral temporal, contralateral nasal, heavy retinal fibers are there in that. It also has the pupillary reflex fibers and it will be projecting ultimately to lateral geniculate body. And uh, how will it project uh, to lateral geniculate body? It will project to lateral geniculate body. And then additionally what else it will do? It will pass via the brachium of superior colliculus to the pretectal nuclei and superior colliculus. And pretectal nuclei fibers are the ones which ultimately will go to the Edinger Westfall and lead to pupillary light reflex. So from where does it get the blood supply? Optic tract, optic chiasma gets from anterior artery. Whereas optic tract will get blood flow from the anterior choroidal and posterior communicating artery. Any transection of it will lead to contralateral homonymous hemianopia and uh, any compression of it will lead to velarian degeneration retrogradely and ultimately where it is reaching to lateral geniculate body, you know, even lateral geniculate body will undergo degeneration. Then what is lateral geniculate body? It is a thalamic relay nucleus. It receives from the ipsilateral temporal hemiretina, 
which will be terminating in layer 2, 3 and 5 and contralateral nasal hemiretina which will be ending up in layer 1, 4 and 6. <coughs> it gives rise to geniculo calacrine tract which will be ultimately reporting to visual radiation which is located in the primary visual cortex area 17. So, if you look at the lateral geniculate nucleus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 you have got the various layers into which it is being uh, broken into and it will be giving rise to the geniculo calacrine tract which will be ultimately going to the uh, visual cortex. Now, this is a titubated image where you can see the lateral geniculate nucleus as a faint low signal focus in the lateral margin of the posterior thalamus is a part of the thalamus. Then uh, in the visual cortex, calacrine cortex, how will you recognize it? There is something called a stripe of genery. It marks the calacrine cortex. And what is uh, 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 this lateral geniculate body is basically uh, made up of doctor. I mean, what is the blood supply of the lateral geniculate body in thalamus? We have the posterior cerebral artery and the anterocroidal artery, which will be providing the blood supply, and any destruction of it lead to contralateral homonymous hemianopia, just like the optic tract. Then you are having the next important part, which is called as uh, geniculo calacrine tract. From the lateral geniculate body, it is going to visual cortex. And what is the main blood supply of it? It is not posterior cerebral artery. It is, it is posterior cerebral artery. How a branch of posterior cerebral artery, which is called calacrine artery, is the one which is supplying. But uh, it is also irrigated by middle cerebral artery and anterocoroidal artery, which one geniculo calacrine tract. And any transaction of it will lead to contralateral homonymous hemianopia. Now. This geniculo calacrine tract is having one upper division and lower division. Upper division will project to the upper bank of the calacrine sulcus, which is called the cuneus. And it contains the input from there, from the superior retinal quadrant, representing the inferior visual field. And any transaction of it will typically lead to contralateral, contralateral lower homonymous quadrant denopia, right. Then uh, lower division of this geniculo calacrine tract basically loops around the LGB and hence it is called Mayer's loop and it will be terminating ultimately into the lower bank of the calacrine fissure in the visual cortex and it brings the infer and what is that lower bank of the calacrine uh, fissure called as? Lingual gyrus, upper bank is called cuneus. Okay, so and uh, what does it basically receive? It receives the inferior retina's visual field, which is looking towards the superior visual field. So, any lesion of that will lead to contralateral upper homonymous quadrant anopia, transaction of this Mayer's loop. That is all the story of uh, the geniculo calacrine tract. Now, where is the visual cortex area 17? It is along the banks of the calacrine sulcus where it is located. And what does it basically receive doctor? It receives the retinal input from the ipsilateral LGB and it receives the blood supply from the calcrine artery which is the branch of the posterior cerebral artery. Sometimes it is a favorite question of the examiner. Calcrine artery is a branch of what means we are dazed, middle or posterior. Then suddenly somewhere, somewhere we remember hemorrhosis, pugox, loss of vision, internal carotid and we stop thinking about posterior cerebral. But you need to think about posterior cerebral. So, posterior cerebral calcrine artery is the main blood supply to the calcrine cortex. And uh, it also anastomoses with the middle cerebral artery. And this anastomosis is the one which mainly makes the macula from getting spared. This anastomosis between the posterior cerebral arteries, calacrine art branch and the middle cerebral artery will make the macular area from getting spared whenever the visual cortex is the cause of blindness, if there is any lesion of the 
visual cortex. So, any lesion of this calcarine uh, cortex will lead to contralateral homonymous hemianopia, but there is a sparing of the macula area because the macular area part of uh, the calcarine, uh, I mean the visual cortex is having a anastomosis between the posterior cerebral and middle cerebral, hence macular sparing will be there. If there is any lesion of the lesion homonymous hemianopia, if it is because of uh, uh, visual cortex, where else do you get homonymous hemianopia? We also get whenever optic tract is involved or if there is any involvement of the lateral geniculate body. But there macula is not spared, macula is involved. But in this there is a macular sparing when the visual cortex is involved. Any bilateral destruction of both the cuneae, cuneae are upper uh, bank or lower bank? Upper bank lead to lower altitudinal hemianopia. Any destruction of the lower bank which is called the lingual guy lead to upper altitudinal hemianopia. So that's all the story, doctor, about uh, the visual cortex. Okay. Now, what is the organization of this visual cortex? We have already reviewed. Posterior third of the visual cortex receives from macular input, central vision. Intermediate area receives from paramacular input, and anterior area receives from totally peripheral part of the vision, which is called as monocular input. So, these are all the things, this is the most important illustration. Where will be macular sparing type of hemianopia? If the visual cortex is involved, that is a point of interest. So, doctor, um, shall we finish? Light reflexes, already we discussed it, no big challenge. Light is shined into one eye, the same eye pupil constricts direct, contralateral is the other eye. So, what is the afferent limb for this? You have the cranial nerve 2 and what is the efferent limb? Parasympathetic fibers of the cranial nerve 3 and from there is the whole story starting once more from the ganglion cells where the light is perceived and they go to the pretectal nuclei in the midbrain. From there both the uh, ipsilateral, contralateral, both sides Edinger westfall is being stimulated. From Edinger westfall the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers I mean preganglionic parasympathetic fibers will go to ciliary ganglion. From ciliary ganglion, postganglionic fibers will be passing and supply the sphincter pupillae is what need to be remembered. Then what is the pupillary dilatation pathway that we have doctor? Typically it is a sympathetic division and where is it starting from? Hypothalamus. From hypothalamus the descending uh, pathway will be bringing the sympathetic uh, preganglionic fibers and it will be reported to the ciliospinal center of bunch in T1, T2. And uh, uh, basically the ciliospinal center of bunch in T1, T2, it will project these preganglionic sympathetic fibers to the sympathetic ganglion. Where is that located? There is an area called superior cervical ganglion. and uh, from superior cervical ganglion, the postganglionic fibers through the perivascular plexus of the carotid system will be reaching the dilator pupillae of the iris and that ultimately lead to development of pupillary dilatation. They will also go and supply the palpebral muscle fibers, the postganglionic sympathetic fibers, palpebral muscles of uh, Muller of the eyelid. So, that is the reason any Horner or any interruption will lead to the development of uh, inophthalmos, ptosis and uh, enhydrosis. Then from the superior cervical ganglion, how are these fibers are passing and reaching the eye? They will be passing during this journey through cavernous sinus and they will also be passing through superior orbital fissure. Any lesion of superior orbital fissure or cavernous sinus can lead to interruption of this postganglionic fibers between superior cervical ganglion and the pupil, dilator pupillae is what need to be remembered. Then whenever we are reading, however, both eyes are coming closer to each other, which is called convergence accommodation reaction. It is very simple that um, convergence will occur when 
the middle recti are stimulated uh, because they are innervated by ocular motor. Accommodation means what, doctor? The refractory power of the lens is being controlled. So the parasympathetic innervation will ultimately supply the ciliary muscle. Ciliary muscle will make either the jonules of the lens become either relaxed or tensed. That will change the curvature of the lens and that brings the change in the refractory power. So that is called the change of accommodation. Then um, uh, that's all the story, doctor. This is only a repetition of what we have studied in ophthalmology.